Well, my name is Kaylin Shaparo, and I have the pleasure of kicking off our winter Bible study this month. It is going to be an amazing month for our church. Um, this next few weeks, uh, it's going to be uh, really rich for our church. It's going to be really edifying. Our separate Sunday school classes kind of get to come together as a big family unit under the umbrella of God's Word, and um, it's, it's such a good time. Uh, we had a great winter Bible study last year, too, so really looking forward to it. Uh, this month is going to include crucial topics to our Christian walk, uh, including the importance of humility, which is today's lesson. Uh, trusting in the Lord, led by Bob Woods, is going to be next. Uh, confidence in God's eternal kingdom with Pastor Mike after that. And then finally wrapping up the last week uh, with confession and forgiveness led by Pastor Mark as we work through the book of Daniel. That's where we're going to be working through. Uh, these classes are going to be really rich with information, so I highly suggest everyone take notes. Uh, please feel free to participate in the discussion as we walk through some questions. And uh, just prayerfully ask God to refine you over these next few weeks. And uh, as I try to mention very often, that when the church is edified, God is glorified through that. So that's the purpose of these teachings, is that you would be edified and you would leave um, with a better understanding of Scripture. So uh, I just wanted to make sure, does everyone have a handout? These were in the front. Raise your hand if you need a handout. And and we can get those to you. So this will kind of follow along with my lesson this morning. There, there's lines where you can take notes. Uh, you can also jot down answers or thoughts you have to the questions that we go through. So uh, this will be really helpful. Uh, before we jump into scripture, I'd love to ask a question to the group here. Uh, when have you experienced a very arrogant person? Um, maybe just a few people can raise their hands, and maybe you've had a boss, a coworker, a family member, very arrogant. Yes? Uh, in the mirror, myself. In the mirror, yeah. <laughs> Amen, yes. Yeah, in the mirror. We all experience that, right? Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. I had a uh, past uh, or ex-manager... Uh, that was always, uh, he was taking credit of, uh, or see, we took, what is it? I'm trying to read my notes here. Um, <clears throat> let's say he would brag about uh, to someone else and looked at me and say, I taught her everything that she knows, mm -hmm. where it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. And to this day, those words, really hurt me yeah. that, you know, just something after all these years that always stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that, like, is climbed the ladder, but you know what? He fell down. Yeah. 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 Pride comes before the fall. Yeah. Yes, brother. There are many arrogant people in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really hard. Those can affect us very much. And, uh, affect us throughout our whole lives. Um, many of us have experienced the frustration and agony of dealing with someone who acts proud and arrogant, and humans, no matter what religious or non-religious background they have, understand intuitively that um, it's a repugnant trait um, over arrogance. And uh, in today's section, uh, of kind of the discipleship guides will kind of be following along that scaffolding, um, and you can just go through it in the handout. We'll be in chapter 4, and we'll be reading about the humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so many of us are, fit, are uh, familiar with this, with this story. So I, I wanted to start off um, this to kind of get you set in where we are in Scripture in the timeline instead of just being thrown right into it and not really understanding where we are and what's happening. So at the beginning of the book of Daniel, the story is set right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem. The city had been plundered, and uh, the inhabitants there were taken into exile. One of these people was Daniel. And the book of Daniel chronicles parts of Daniel's life after going into exile. But an important part of the story is how in the world did we get to the Israelites being dragged into exile? I mean, this was God's chosen people. They were a special people 
and we have them having this terrible thing come down on them, and, and just why is this happening? So uh, why did God allow the Israelites to be taken captive by Babylon? Does anybody remember why this happened? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. They were uh, absorbing those cultures around them that they were told to separate themselves from. Absolutely. Well, let's do a quick rundown of the biblical timeline to understand more fully what is happening to the Israelites and why. And this is going to be a really great stepping off point for the next month to understand where we are in the, in the timeline. So uh, first we have here, we'll start around 966 B.C. Solomon builds the temple of God, and this is just an amazing structure. You read about it through the beginning of the Bible, and it's so beautiful. All the adornments, everything that they went through to build this massive structure. Uh, next up, the wealth of Solomon. Uh, he ends up gaining tons of wealth. This is a, a depiction of the Queen of Sheba coming to visit him and see what this is all about, and see how his kingdom is functioning, and she's blown away by this. Uh, Solomon ends up defying God's law, and obtains many wives, and commits adultery. And this is kind of that uh, spark that sets off that domino effect that will ripple all the way through their culture and into the Bible. Uh, First, First Kings uh, Chronicles will highlight this. So uh, if you would, um, you can turn with me. And we're going to read in 1 Kings chapter 11, if you want to turn there. I'm going to be reading out of 1 Kings chapter 11. And this is just going to highlight what King Solomon did and kind of that first domino that set off the rest. 1 Kings chapter 11, and we'll just read through verses 1 through 10. It says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, Ammonites on the mountain east of Jerusalem. So he's actually setting up altars for these other gods. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning these things that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. So you can see here that first domino that sets this off, and it's going to lead up into where we are into the book of Daniel. Then from roughly 950 B.C. to 600 B.C., it's about 350 years, chaos and paganism run rampant. God sends prophets like Elijah, Joel, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel to warn Israel and Judah, but to no avail. In 722 B.C., Israel falls to Assyria. Scripture tells us why this occurred. We're going to jump to 2 Kings chapter 17. And I'll be reading verses 7 through 18 to give you this picture of what happened here. 2 Kings 17, 7 through 18. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. 
And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in all their towns from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and a shirim at every high hill and under every green tree. And there they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did, whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. And they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, turn your evil ways, turn from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers, and that I set to you by my servants the prophets, but they would not listen, but were stubborn as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They despised his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went from false idols and became false, and they followed the nations that were around them, concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do like them. And they abandoned all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves metal images of two calves, and they made an Asherah and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they burned their sons and daughters as offerings and used divination and omens and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore the Lord was angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only." You see complete rebellion here and turning to other gods. We see this in the book of Hosea highlighted how um, they're cheating on God. They're committing adultery with these idols. And we see the effects here and what's happening that trickle down all the way into where we are today. In 722 BC, Israel falls to Assyria. Scripture tells us you know, why this occurred. And by 586 BC, Judah falls to Babylon. And shortly after, Daniel is taken captive to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar orders that some men, um, wise young men from the Judean captives, be brought in to serve his royal palace. Daniel is part of this. God gives the chief of staff respect and affection for Daniel, as well as the ability to interpret dreams and signs. Uh, scripture states that after these men were trained, they were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel. So God set him up into this uh, scenario and gave him the ability to uh, be in front of the king. And King Nebuchadnezzar ends up having a dream that only Daniel is able to interpret. The king is actually so awestruck by Daniel's power that he actually praises Yahweh and makes Daniel a high ruler over the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar then has a second dream. Daniel interprets the dream and warns the king that unless he repents and humbles himself, he will be driven out of society and given an insane mind and he will act like a beast of the field. Um, but as we all know, uh, one year after that warning dream, the king has refused to humble himself, and the prophecy Daniel spoke of becomes fulfilled. So let's begin our reading. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 is where we'll be at. We're going to start at verse 28. We'll be reading 28 through 30. And we're going to work through five study points that will work as a scaffolding for us uh, as we go through this lesson. So point number one, we should boast in God and not in ourselves. Point number two, God is in control. We'll be discussing his sovereignty. Point three, those who rebel against God face his judgment. Point four, no one can compare to God's power. And then we'll finish up with point five, God will humble the prideful. So we'll start in uh, point number one. We should boast in God, not in ourselves. This is Daniel 4, verses 28 through 30. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power, as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? 
Now, it may feel slightly disconnected for us to imagine this scenario that kind of took place so long ago, so I wanted to modernize it a little bit so we can connect with it better. Um, I want you to imagine this guy, and he's your neighbor, okay? And this neighbor is full of pride, and he has it all. He's got the big house, the big boat, the new travel trailer. He's got quads. He has everything that someone seemingly could desire here in America. And the man steps out in front of his house on the street and looks at it and says, look at everything which I have accumulated by my hard work and my own wisdom and for the glory of my life. What would you think of a person like that? What do you think God would think of a person like that? We dare not take credit for what God has done in our lives. And notice the language the king uses, I have built by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty. The self-centeredness of the king could not be any more apparent in this passage. Walking on his roof, it's overlooking the entire city, and he was filled with pride uh, at these amazing feats that had been accomplished. And uh, he had been taken over by the sin of pride. And it's so easy to look at the king here and condemn him, but how many of us can relate to this story, right? As someone had mentioned, when you look in the mirror and you can see yourself in these passages, whether it's circumstances or money or possessions or maybe even a good grade on a test, who of us can understand that craving as humans to attribute um, our something good happening in our lives to our own strength and our own abilities. And this ultimately is a lack of humility and that step into pride. So this first uh, question, how can you avoid the trappings of your own success? And I like part two of this. It says, do you have to be successful to fall into the trappings of pride? What do you guys think? Yeah, Ginger. I continually in the past reminded of myself when something good happened that, you know, that's only for a second that it's pleasing, it's yeah. not reality. Um, yeah. We used to have a saying on our team, yeah, we're the flavor of the month, but that's going to change next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. I was going to say, some of the most prideful people I've ever met have been incredibly poor, abject poverty and everything else. They will not recognize when they need help or accept it. Mm. It's so hard to help someone or get them to understand that it's coming from a place of love, not mm. of charity or pride on my part or anything like that. Just trying to get them to, to accept help and, and to... Because if we could do it in our own power, we would. Mm. So Amen. Yeah. To recognize that need is there. Yeah, absolutely. You do not have to have success and money to be prideful. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to be successful in your own right. I know several people who will take uh, the, um, the opportunity to say that because that person is successful is because what I did for them or what I've done. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, brother. That's good. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. Uh, we're going to dive into point number two, God is in control. This will be verses 31 through 32. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Notice how it states, while the words were still in the king's mouth. This is because there's no ambiguity that will be reached here. No thinking that this was a punishment of God for something else. The consequences were tied to Nebuchadnezzar's proclamation that God's um, ultimately in control and sovereign. And there's no doubt about this. One of the most essential points to this section of Scripture is understanding that God is in control. He has the power to do whatever He wishes. Scripture says this about God's sovereignty. Before Him, all the nations are as nothing, 
They were regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. God says later, I form the light and I create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. So these are amazing points of God's sovereignty that he is in control. I'd like to read um, a section from Job. This is Job chapter 12. Again, you can turn to this. Um, you can just listen as well. Job chapter 12, 7 through 25. I'll give you just a second to turn there. Seven through twenty-five, and this really highlights the sovereignty of God that we see weaved through Scripture. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you; the birds of the heavens, and they will tell you; or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you; and the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In His hand is the life of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. Does not the ear test words, and the palate taste food? Wisdom is with the aged, and understanding the length of days. With God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. If he tears down, none can rebuild. If he shuts a man in, none can open. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the land. With him are strength and sound wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away stripped, and judges he makes fools. He looses the bonds of kings and binds a waist cloth on their hips. He leads priests away stripped and overthrows the mighty. He deprives of speech those who are trusted and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on princes and loosens the belt of the strong. He uncovers the depths out of darkness and brings deep darkness to light. He makes nations great, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. He takes away understanding from the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a trackless waste. They grope in the dark without light. He makes them stagger like a drunken man. The Lord alone can give us wisdom or take it away, it says, as he pleases. He is in full control, and we as Christians can take comfort in that. It's obvious to us as Christians that in God's amazing grace, he even uses his sovereignty to discipline us for our own good. And that leads us into our next question. How has God's grace seen in the disciplining of Nebuchadnezzar? How was God's grace seen? Do you see grace there in him being disciplined? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he could have wiped him out right away, right? <coughs> Gives him a chance. Absolutely. The only way he could come yeah. out of his insanity was to be made sane. Amen. And yeah. the only way to be made sane is to see yourself as who you really are. Absolutely. And he did it. We are going to dive into that next. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah, Brother Rick, did you have something? Through that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you can see his grace in this, and we're going to dive into this more. Point number three, those who rebel against God will face his judgment. We're going to read verse 33. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. This was probably the most fun part of doing this study, was learning about this. So has anyone heard of zoanthropy before? It, it's fairly rare. Okay? Um, clinical zoanthropy is a delusion in which a person believes himself or herself to be an animal. And a specific type of zoanthropy known as boanthropy 
consists of a delusion in which a person believes himself or herself to be a cow, a bovine. That's where it comes from. So actually, since 1850, there have been 56 documented cases of this. The patients consisted of 34 men, uh, there was 22 women, and the symptoms lasted anywhere from a single hour to decades. People would have this illness come upon them. And the amazing part here is that God sovereignly uses this mental illness on Nebuchadnezzar to humble him. God shows the king and those around them that without God in our lives, without submitting to his will and his purpose, that we are no better than the animals. Hey, that's what Rick and Pastor Mark were talking about, that point, that we are no better than the animals apart from God. <clears throat> this picture is its a living testimony of the fate of those who reject God. And we'll talk about that. We're going to read in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, King Solomon talks about this in Ecclesiastes uh, when talking about the futility of living a life apart from God. He says this, Surely the fate of human beings is like that of animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals Everything is meaningless. And so if you read in the context of Ecclesiastes, he's laying out this um, picture of what life is like apart from God. And he says that ultimately, apart from God, everything is meaningless. We're like animals. Our fate is no better than theirs apart from God. And he just lays this out beautifully throughout the whole book, and it ties together so wonderfully in the end. So I highly suggest, um, if you haven't read the book, Ecclesiastes in a while, reading that, it's, it's uh, phenomenal. Uh, so I, I want to take um, just like five minutes, and this question is going to be a little different. Um, it's going to be a, a group discussion, so just over the next few minutes with the people around you, I'd like you to talk about why do you think King Solomon states that life without God is ultimately meaningless? So just take a few moments with the people around you, just kind of naturally form into some s small groups here, talk about that, and then after that, uh, I'll, I'll ask what you guys came up with. So, so go ahead.
All right, everyone, thank you so much for discussing that. Let's come back together and we will discuss some of your answers. So what did some of the groups come up with? Why do you think King Solomon states that life without God is ultimately meaningless? Go ahead, somebody... Go ahead. Basically, he experienced it all. He had everything that you could possibly have as a human being and found it empty. Yeah. Because it doesn't last and it has no value in itself. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, that value is found only in God. Amen. Yeah. We talked about design. We've got all this stuff. We've got these abilities. What do we do with it? We're meant to use our faculties for something that's to glorify God. But we're frustrated when we try to use it for other things and it doesn't work. Mm. Mm, yeah, that's so good. Yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, anybody else? Um, Ms. Cook just really talked about purpose. If, if we're, we step out of our God-created purpose of worshiping God, then we worship everything else. And it becomes meaningless. Yeah. We just keep chasing around this messed up life and forgetting what we were cr are created for. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Our purpose kind of leads us into our next point. Point number four, no one can compare to God's power. Uh, this will be verses 34 through 35. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. We just uh, read that earlier in, from the book of Isaiah. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
what have you done? What happens after the king goes through this humbling process? You know, does he shake his fist at God and say, how dare you do this to me? You know, you're going to pay for this. Uh, he realizes that God is ultimately in control. He was humbled by a tough situation, as many of us have, have had happen. He even realizes that while his dominion is temporary, that God's dominion is ultimately eternal and will last forever. And uh, I think we all go through times in our lives like that um, where we don't quite realize that our life here on earth will end eventually, especially when we're younger. Um, it often takes a shaking in our lives um, for us to understand that, that we are but a breath. Yeah. And we're here and then we're gone. And how many generations upon generations of people, your dad's 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 dad back, have, have come and gone and left this earth? You know? um, that leads us to another great question. This one was uh, so good. Recount a humbling experience that caused you to recognize God and to offer him the honor and praise he is due. And you could even talk about how did your experience compare with Nebuchadnezzar's experience. Uh, I'm sure all of us, or even most of us, have um, had a humbling experience that brought us to Christ. I don't know if anybody wants to, to share that. How have you been humbled and it made you recognize the sovereignty and the power of God? Yeah. Mine was uh, with success. I went to a uh, tryout for the police department, and they were all experienced officers. All I had was college. And I walked in, and everybody looked better than me. And I just said, Lord, I'm done. It's 969 cops, 1,000 cops, and for 25 spots. And I said, it's impossible. And I heard the Lord speak to me. If I want you to be a policeman, you'll be a policeman. Amen. And so I just went out, and he says, just go out and do your best. And I did, and I scored 25th. <laughs> but <laughs> I knew, and I knew that I was not the 25th guy. Yeah. I was the 580th guy or maybe the 969th guy. And it brought me to my knees. Because I knew he had given it to me. Yeah. Mm. Amen. There's no way. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Mm. That's so good. Thank you for sharing that. I've had other ones. The other ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, when I moved to Nevada, um, prior to me moving, I was living with a gentleman, and he was very verbally abusive. And he was an alcoholic. And I was the one supporting me, him, and his drunken brother as well. <laughs> so it got to the point that I just couldn't handle it anymore. And I got down on my knees and I prayed and I said, Lord, help me get out of this situation that I'm in. If it's your will, you're going to make things happen. My sister called me three days later and said, hey, Bonnie, I'm moving to Nevada. And if you'd like, you can come live with me and pay half the rent after you get a job, yada, yada, yada. And then she says, but you'll have to have the money to get out of here. And I started squirreling away $20 here and $10 <coughs> there and $20 there. And the next thing you know, I had the money saved up that he hadn't found. He would go through my wallet looking for money. He would take my debit card. Hmm. You know, I would take it out of the debit card and hide it. And, you know, it happened. I mean, things fell into place for me to leave. And it was God's will that I get out of that situation. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that so good? When when we're in the storm, sometimes it doesn't seem like there's any way out. And you're thinking, why is this happening? I do not understand. And then now, in retrospect, we can look back and go, oh, okay, that was his hand in it. He guided everything. Mine it's would... his hand that I got out to, though. Amen. It was definitely his hand because... I didn't have the money to get out. I didn't have a place to go to. I didn't have a job when I got here. I didn't have any supports, you know, at all in place before my sister called and said, listen, 
you know. Yeah. And I even started applying for jobs before I ever got <coughs> there to move here, and I got a job. I got here March 21st, and I got a job and started April 4th. Yeah, that's so cool. So God made it happen. Only God, yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. I had a time, um, we lived in Susanville, and we were kind of transitioning back to moving here. And so I had to be at a skilled nursing facility where I worked at 6 in the morning. So I'm driving. I left Susanville usually like 4.30, 4.15, 4.30. And I'm driving, and there's nothing. I mean, it's, it's miles and miles and miles of nothing. And all of a sudden, um, you know, there would be those passing lanes. So I was just had this, like, I could, I could hear God telling me, move over. Get in the other lane. I'm like, I don't want to get it. Like, there's nothing. Why am I getting over? I, there's nothing. And so I was coming up the road, and finally I'm like, oh, all right already. I don't know. Like, I'll get over. In two more seconds, what I didn't know is on the other side, there was a police officer chasing a guy. And he had made it into oncoming traffic where I was. If I hadn't moved over... It would have hit him. They were going well over 90 miles an hour. I would have hit him head on. And, and I mean, here we are. It's, you know, 5 in the morning. I'm coming from Susanville. There's a whole lot of nobody. I mean, I was the only one. And I, I just couldn't see over that hill. And if I hadn't, if I hadn't, I would have. There's no way I would have survived that day. Mm -hmm. You know, and after that, I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, because sometimes you think things are going fine, and there's nothing going on. You know, and, and that was really humbling because I was like, holy cow, I hadn't listened. I mean, I was within two seconds because I was almost to the top of the, the hill, and that's when it came to mind. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. Yeah, I've, I've heard so many stories like that. And we were talking in the college class uh, a few Sundays ago about the sovereignty of God and how he can just see all of that already, everything that's going to happen. And you imagine a little bug that's sitting on a rug and he's looking out and he just sees all these twisted fibers and it just looks like this huge mess. But then if you take it from our perspective as humans standing up and looking at the rug, we can see the intricate designs of all the threads weaved together and how it turns into a beautiful picture. So I, we're, we have that bug's perspective in a way. We can't see the whole picture like God does, but, but he sees it. Yeah. Amen. Well, we'll move on. Uh, last up, point number five, God will humble the prideful. And this, this is really going to tie in all, all the points together uh, in, into a beautiful picture here. This is verses 36 through 37 in Daniel chapter 4. At the same time, my reason... Oh, excuse me. Give me just one sec. Make sure we're on the right one. Okay. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom. And still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Notice the king expresses his joy that his reason returned to him. Pastor Mike mentioned that, our faculties, our reason. And the interesting thing is, after saying this, reason and praise of God are intrinsically tied together. And that was one of the most fascinating aspects of doing this study over the last few months, is tying that together. And proper and godly reason is a gift from the Lord. And proper and godly reason extols the creator, as the passage states. God says, let us reason together in the book of Isaiah. Our reason is something that we can use to glorify God, and we should use to glorify him. And proper reason results in humble worship and praise of him, as you see in this passage. A person who refuses to worship God is thus unreasonable. When we reject God and detach ourselves from ultimate reality, um, it's, it's a humbling experience and it can lead to consequences. Um, when we do reject God, it ultimately leads to absurdity. And we'll talk about that. This is why an atheistic position falls to pieces when it's pressed. 
This is the idea that there's no God, no spiritual realm, no objective meaning or purpose, and that humans are merely sacks of goo that have evolved over time from fish. And the sacks of goo scurry around, and we consume material, and we eat and poop and reproduce and die, and then more sacks of goo from them eat, poop, and reproduce and die. <laughs> and a godless person may say, you can do good things without belief in God, and many actually do, because um, we have uh, that impression in us. We're made in the image of God. And I, I would ask them, and I do ask them, what do you mean by good? And most reply with, well, it would be reducing pain or suffering as much as possible, Just reducing pain and increasing pleasure. And my response would be, what is pain? And a materialistic, atheistic answer to that is that pain is electrical signals. And I got to research that too, the biology of pain. And you have sensors all over your bodies and your skin. And when you are touched, there's an electrical signal that goes up to your brain, and then your brain interprets that as uh, either a light touch or something harder as pain. So um, I, I brought in something for an illustration. See if you guys are familiar with these. Does anyone know what this is? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it's a Roomba, yeah. So, so for all intents and purposes, we'll, we'll say this is a Roomba. This is, uh, since I'm cheap, I got a Eufy. It's like a ripoff of a Roomba. <laughs> but anyway, we're just gonna pretend this is a Roomba vacuum. And uh, I, I wanna share some traits that this vacuum has uh, that it actually shares with us. So uh, it has eyes, it has cameras to look around. So as it's going, uh, it won't bump into a wall. It has eyes to see and it will avert itself. <laughs> It has touch and can feel pain, what we would consider pain. There's sensors on here, and they send an electrical signal to its brain, its processor, so that it knows it's feeling something and how hard it's pressing against something. Uh, it eats its food as electricity, and it has a stomach, which is its battery. It has a processor that acts like a brain. It senses signals and backs away if it bumps into something too hard. Uh, it also has memories that it can recall, and it can use these memories to avoid future events that could harm it. Uh, it has an apparatus to move itself around. We have legs, but it has wheels, so it can scoot around its environment. Um, it can become tired and rest when stressed by stopping and taking a break if it gets overheated. Uh, it can even sense when there's too much waste inside of it, and it will find a bathroom to evacuate its bowels. <laughs> so it literally poops. If you guys, you guys can look it up on the website, it's got its own little toilet, and when it feels like it has to go to the bathroom, that it will find its bathroom, and then it poops into it. So it's pretty cool. Um, this creature can literally see, feel, experience pain, react to that pain, eat, move around its environment, get tired and rest, make advanced calculations, can communicate with us and other Roombas via a complex language. It has memories of past experiences and can even find its way to the toilet to go to the bathroom. So what's the difference between me and this Roomba? Okay, I have this slide here, let me put him away. Why can I take... <laughs> I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Why can I take a hammer to that Roomba and smash it to bits and throw it into a trash can, but I can't do that to a human without being thrown into jail? What would an atheist say to that? Because he's made of plastic, and we're, we're goo, we're flesh, we're protoplasm. So does a material that a creature is made up of determine its worth or value? Maybe because he can't reproduce like we can? What if a human can't reproduce? Does that mean that they lose that quality of being a human being? You know, this trickles down into the abortion issue, things like this. So what does it mean that we have the image of God, that we're made in the image of God. Um, and talking about our value, maybe an atheist would say that our society dictates our value. Um, 
That, that's what most people agree on. It's a majority vote. But does that mean majority vote determines if something is right and wrong? There is a time when chattel slavery was considered right by most of the majority of the population that didn't make it right. Majority vote obviously doesn't determine right and wrong for us. The truth is, from a godless perspective, there is nothing objectively right and wrong. There is no objective value of a person. It's all relative to each individual, and because of this, its foundation is arbitrary. Its premise is built on the preface uh, or preferences of individuals at that time and place and therefore has no objective standard to abide by. I think uh, Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist and college professor, uh, explained the rationale of a godless universe the best. He says this, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, others are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. And what's so amazing is it sounds like he's been reading Ecclesiastes because he agrees with King Solomon. He says, yes, absolutely, if there is no God, that there's no purpose, there's no meaning, no one has real value. Everything is meaningless. So it's such a good tie-in to Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> Richard Dawkins is spot on here. In a world void of God, everything is arbitrary. Everything is meaningless. There's no good, no evil. It's just stardust bumping into stardust. And that's what we do in these conditions. We're all fizzing right now. We have a little electrical signals. We are uh, what Dr. Frank Turek likes to call meat robots. So uh, we're like little room of vacuums, but we're not made of plastic. We're made of meat. And that's what makes us up. Um, it's logical outworkings descend into absurdity, but the logical outworkings of Christianity result in objective and solid meaning, purpose, human value, real right and wrong, real justice, not just arbitrary preferences. And that's what I love about Christianity. I, I was not raised a uh, Christian. I became Christian and was saved when I was 30 years old. And so seeing this was so beautiful that Christianity is so logical and it makes sense and it's internally consistent. It doesn't result in absurdity and absurd notions. There is an eternal being who created you and set up a framework that's logical. You have meaning and value and purpose um, that have ultimately eternal consequences because we were handcrafted by God as his image bearers. And uh, we are to reflect God's character in our lives. That's why we don't inflict unjust pain on others, not because the majority of us have arbitrarily deemed this so, but because it's objectively true and it's logically consistent. And atheists can be kind and loving and do good things, and many do, but they have to borrow from the Christian worldview to espouse those values as anything but arbitrary. And a godless person stands ultimately on shifting sand, but the Christian stands on a solid rock. Amen. And I think this really highlights a point in Jesus' illustration. It's Matthew chapter 7. I have the slide up here. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority not as their teachers of the law. So my question to you today, Christian, is this. Are you standing on the rock today? Are you standing on Jesus Christ, the eternal, the unchanging, the foundation of life and meaning itself, the foundation 
of everything here on earth that we live out? Or are you standing on shifting sand? There is no other rock but Christ. Scripture says salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Will you have the humility, like the king in this verse here, to admit that God is perfect and right and just, and you have sinned against him, and because of that, you deserve separation from him in a place called hell because of your thoughts and actions, and acknowledge that he is your only hope for salvation? Or will you let your pride and arrogance consume you as you set your face like stone against him because you want to be in charge and do whatever you think is right and fulfill your own desires as you see fit so you can be your own God and we know what that leads to. I don't want that for you. God does not want that for you. He does not want that for us. Scripture says, God's desire being that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe the gospel. Your life is a breath in the wind. You're here one day, you're gone the next. None of us know whether we're making it home today. None of us can determine that. I, I've felt that when my family or I have gotten sick uh, I got meningitis recently. I know Chris Nelson had meningitis too. It can be deadly. And in those moments when you have family members that get sick and the doctors can't heal them, that you start to see that we are out of control. We are not in control, but God is. His sovereign hand is on us. 150,000 people die every 24 hours on earth. That's the population of a small city is wiped out every single 24 hours. Don't leave this earth without knowing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sin, trust in him, <coughs> surrender everything to Christ. That is your only hope. It's not perfection, it's surrender. Amen. So that was it. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to close in prayer and, and then we'll get out of here. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for big blue skies and um, the animals and the beauty of the environment around us. Thank you for creating us in your image and giving us life, giving us hope through your son, Jesus. Lord, we can't do it on our own. We'll never make it. We know that we'll never make that standard, but that your son, Jesus, came down and fulfilled that for us, Lord. And that we know that by believing in him, trusting in him, that he died and rose from the grave, Lord, and, and conquered death. Lord, we know we have eternal life through him. Thank you for doing that for us, Lord. We love you so much. Thank you for being with our class today. May your heart, may your words pierce our hearts, Lord. May it sink in. May we soak in the power of your word every day throughout this week. Would you encourage us and spur us on to dig deep into your word and to follow you every day with authentic desire and love for you? Lord God, would you please do that inside of us and work that in our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit? And please be with our church, Lord. May, be, may we be a light to everyone around us. <coughs> Lord, please, that we don't want anyone to perish, but we want everyone to have eternal life.